My name is Eric, and I'm here with Andrew. We're going to walk through a few questions. We want to encourage you to participate along in the comments. Andrew, we're in the middle of this series called The Relationship Playbook. Can you say hello to everybody and let us know kind of where we're at in the series so far? Hi, guys. Uh, it is week number two of Relationship Playbook, and this has been an awesome series for us because it's all about what does it take to have an effective marriage? What does it take to have an effective relationship with other people? And this weekend was great because it was all about having realistic expectations mm -hmm. of, man, how to have a great marriage, how to have a great relationship. So it was so good this weekend. So good. And so we're going to be going through a couple of questions here. And for all of you following along, if uh, maybe if you're in a small group right now, you can use this pause whenever you need to, to discuss as a group. Uh, maybe if you just got other people in the house, go ahead and pause and ask them the questions yourself or comment along with us on Facebook. You can uh, pause at any time too and just journal some answers as well uh, because we're really kind of going through the small group discussion questions. Andrew, can you tell us a little bit about small groups and why they're so important to us? Uh, we love small groups around Sagebrush because it's the way that we take a big size church and we make it smaller so that people can feel loved, cared for, and appreciated. Man, it's a great opportunity just to sit side by side with a band of brothers or a band of sisters so that you can just do life together. Uh, we know that life can be hard and difficult. We've said this all the time around here. You are either in a storm, you're coming out of a storm, or you're going into a storm. And so we know that the safest place for you to be is in community. That's where you're going to grow closer to God, and that's where you're going to find people who are just going to be by your side no matter what you're facing. And so, man, we believe life change happens best in the context of a group. And I think it's a great point, especially now that we're in this relationship series. So if you are married or you're in a committed relationship, the best way that you can kind of help process and talk through mm -hmm. some of the things that are going on in that relationship is to be in another group with other couples. If you're in a relationship and you're thinking about getting married or you're, you know, young, it, the great thing is to learn from couples who've been maybe married a little longer right. than you who are in a different season of life. So it's a great opportunity in small groups as well. So if you're not involved in a small group now, uh, I'm sure one of our hosts will help put the link in on how you can get involved in a small group or just say, hey, I would love to be in a small group and we'll get you connected. So we're going to walk through a couple of questions just so you kind of get an idea of what the small group looks like. Mm -hmm. First, we always start off with an icebreaker. Yes. So here you go. This when, is a good one. This is, this is yeah, we, this might be way too long, but it's okay. We're going to go for it. <laughs> when was a time where you were disappointed because of unrealistic expectations? Uh, go ahead and let us know in the comments here. Andrew, when was the last time you were disappointed because of unrealistic expectations? Um, there's a lot of times that I have had unrealistic expectations, and one of them was seeing the movie Infinity Wars. Um, I know, you know, a Marvel movie, I was looking forward to it. We gathered a, a group of people just to kind of go see the movie from kind of our staff members. And uh, it was great to go out that night, hung out with my buddy Joel, my buddy Chris Lively, and uh, we went to the movie, and man... We sat there and it was like three hours long and it was grueling for me, Eric. I mean, it ends with everybody <laughs> disappearing. It doesn't Whoa, seem to spoilers. make spoilers. I'm sorry. Most of them have seen it okay. okay. But Spidey gets like, I don't know, he falls apart right in front of you. And so, mm. uh, man, I just was disappointed by it. I was bored by it. I don't know if you're a big Marvel fan and you loved that movie, but man, I loved Endgame so much more than that one. But it just seemed like three hours where I think Joel at one point actually fell asleep during the movie. <laughs> and uh, that was pretty sad for Joel because he paid a lot of money for it. So. <laughs> what about you? Uh, well, first I want to know, um, if uh, movies are a great one to be disappointed at. If there was a movie that you were expecting was going to be great and it was just a disappointment, put it in the comments so we know what movie were you just like disappointed by. Another topic that's usually a source of disappointment, especially for me, uh -huh. revolves around food. Uh -huh. So uh, I was born and raised here in Albuquerque and then moved to the Midwest for a while and mm. then came back here in December. So I was expecting like a lot of the places from my childhood, one specifically was the quarters on Wyoming here mm. in Albuquerque. Like we got back and we're like, all right, we're gonna go to the quarters, we're gonna get birds, drive mm. by it, Close. No more quarters. No more quarters. And then when I was growing up, there was this restaurant called Top Dog, and it was on Manal, and I forget what restaurant's there now. Yes. And it was great, man. As a kid, I went there, and I just loved it. Coney Dog, extra cheese and fries. Perfect. Drive by, gone. It's been gone since, like, 2009. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Boarded up everything, probably. Exactly. And then now that we're in this, like, <laughs> coronavirus stay-at-home thing, which we could go to restaurants now. Yes, finally. Praise the Lord. But... Uh, when we were doing a lot of online ordering, it seemed like everywhere that I would do the online ordering, especially like the big chain restaurants, you know, you'd click something. Now I've got a six-year-old or a 
six year old and a seven year old? Yeah, yeah. Seven yes. year old and eight year old at home. I'm glad you know what their That's ages right. are. Yeah. They're, they're really good, Eric. Whatever. They're like, they're this big. Anyway. So, you know, being a dad, when you're going through and you're like, okay, what do you want to eat, right? Get the kids' menu out. Do you want this? I don't want that. I don't want that. Yeah. We finally get the order set. You go to check out, and then it pops up and it says, this item is not available. Mm. So you got to go so back. Bad. And you go, I know you want mac and cheese. I don't have mac and cheese. Well, I want the mac and cheese. Like, okay, can, what, can you get the chicken fingers? Well, I don't want chicken fingers. You know, like all this stuff. Finally click. Item unavailable. Like, why don't they just tell you it's not available before you're able to click on it? I mean, don't put it on the menu, folks. <laughs> so, I mean, just make so it easy on us as dads. So that's, I could go on and on about the number of times I've been disappointed by food, I think probably for a long time. But I won't. Let me, let me see, let me see here if anybody else has anything. Okay, a couple, basically every DC movie I think is being listed yes, here. Yes, all There's of a, them have been disappointed. A couple here are being listed here. Let's see. Um, a couple of people are acting like actually answering it seriously, like when people would react or respond the way you want, and then they don't. Ooh. You know, so those sort of responses are big letdowns okay. as well. Um, and then, oh, <laughs> my own cooking disappoints my expectations. Sorry about that, Donna. Um, otherwise, <laughs> if you have anything else that you've done or expectations that you have that have let you down or been disappointed, put them in the comments below. But. Andrew, switching over here. The series is all about relationships and specifically touching on marriage relationships. And so if you are married, um, we want to answer this question. What was your expectation of marriage before you were married? And if you're single, what is your expectation of marriage? So if you've never been married, write down what you think marriage is like. And if you are married, go ahead and let us know what was that expectation before you got married. Andrew, what do you think? Uh, for me, my expectation of marriage was it was romance all the time. Okay. I mean, I was caught up in all the movies and everything else where I thought, man, marriage is just awesome and wonderful. It's romance all the time. Uh, but I awoke the next morning after my honeymoon to bad morning breath and everything else that goes along uh, with marriage. And so uh, different things like that. And Todd talked about some of the, you know, expectations that we have in advance where we thought that it was going to be all adventures and fun and enjoyable, but then married life got hard and it got difficult. And there were different things that we thought it was going to be one way. And it was like, oh man, this is something that's a lot of hard work. It's not easy at all. It takes a lot of effort. Yep. Yeah. I think very similar for me. Um, it's that the thing that I got wrapped up in, like the happily ever after type of mentality is yeah. you do all the hard work in the beginning, you know, you, you grow up, you go through your teens and your mm-hmm. 20s and so for some people 30s and longer, but like you're f- trying to find the right person, you got to go through the whole dating thing and then you do pre-marriage counseling and mentoring and yep. try to figure it all out and it's like once you get that all figured out, you know, what what type of person you are and the division of the chores and all that stuff that you go through yeah. and try to figure, and then you get married and it's going to be happily ever after. Well, uh, I can tell you, I bet if I went back and looked at, especially like the division of labor and uh-huh. chores thing that we did, yes. you know, 13 years ago, we just ripped that bad boy up. No that doubt. doesn't exist no anymore. No doubt at all. And then you don't even like have any idea once you get to uh, kids, mm-hmm. how that just completely throws It completely changes all your expectations too. Yeah. So, Let's talk about those expectations. Which expectations of marriage did you have that were unrealistic? And what expectations of marriage do you think were realistic? So in the comments below, answer unrealistic, these expectations. Realistic, these expectations. What do you think, Mm -hmm. Andrew? Uh, For me, I had the expectation in getting married that uh, my marriage and my life would be just like my parents. And so I thought the things that I learned at home where my mom had these responsibilities and my dad had these responsibilities were just going to play out in my real life marriage. And that was very unrealistic. Uh, what I didn't know was that my wife was a registered nurse and she had a job working full time. And so she had responsibilities of her own and I had to be considerate. Uh, she also didn't know that I was a little bit less clean than I had come off <laughs> when I was dating. Cause I'd always pick things up and clean it up real nice. But man, uh, naturally I'm not quite as clean as a nurse would want me to be. So there were times where her father had a, a number of different responsibilities in her house. He was kind of the deep cleaner. So he would clean all the showers and everything like that. So my wife, when things would get dirty, she'd just leave the cleanser sitting by the shower, oh. <laughs> like with the expectation that I was going to be the one just pick to it up, figure do it out. the deep cleaning. And, um, that's when the fight ensued. 
Uh, we just didn't get along about cleaning and stuff, and we had to figure that one out. And so that was kind of an unrealistic expectation that I thought my wife would just be like my mom and everything else. Uh, a, a realistic expectation is I, I knew that marriage was going to be an adventure. And when I embraced that concept, and I've understood kind of that marriage is ups and downs and good and bad, um, I've been able just to be happy in my marriage and my relationship without kind of trying to force my wife to be something she's not. Yeah. Yeah. And so in the comments here, we've got a couple of people that are saying similar things here. And one, one of the common threads I'm thinking is like unrealistic walking into marriage, thinking it's going to be 50, 50. Yeah. Right. And in reality, like Russell said, and a couple of other people said, like, it's actually more like a hundred, a hundred, yes. or you realize that if you just stop at 50, that's not going to be good. Correct. Enough, right. You know, um, other comments here is, uh, along the same lines of like not realizing that your spouse has baggage mm -hmm. and is a real human being. Yes. Right. I think you tell, you know, like you get into marriage, like, oh, it's going to be exactly either like we were dating, which exactly. is not true or nothing's going to change. You're mm -hmm. never going to have, um, you're, you're never going to have to face adversity. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the, uh, parents or grandparents passing away or Correct. other job loss or sickness, things like that. Just, it's unrealistic to think that that's not really going to affect you. Mm -hmm. So, okay, moving into uh, some of the scripture here, we're going to be Romans chapter 15, verses 7 through 9, if you want to read along, um, or if you want to save that for later. Here it says this, uh, chapter 15, verse 7, Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be given glory. Remember that Christ came as a servant to the Jews to show that God is true to the promises he made to their ancestors. He also came so that the Gentiles might give glory to God for his mercies to them. That is what the psalmist meant when he wrote, For this I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing praises to your name. Now, Andrew, before we ask the question, can you give us just a little bit of background? Like, uh, you've got you've got a couple words in here that, especially if you haven't gone to church or read the Bible a lot, yeah. Jews, Gentiles, yeah. Psalm, just give us a little bit of background there. Yeah, a little background is that uh, inside of Romans, there's two groups of people. There are these Gentile people who are the people who uh, didn't believe in God beforehand, so they're not Jewish. So it's basically anybody who's not Jewish. And then you've got the Jewish people who still followed the law and who, you know, were committed to the scriptures, to the Old Testament and everything else. Now, inside of the Roman church, there was a conversion that mm -hmm. happened. And so these Gentiles came to Christ and these Jewish people came to Christ as well. And they just couldn't get along. They had a hard time trying to figure out kind of what is next and how are we going to get along. And so really Paul's writing here to say, man, you've got to accept one another. Mm which becomes so important for us, like in a relationship, because you got to accept one another in order to be able to, you know, just work and function. So that brings us to our question, how has God accepted you and how should this acceptance affect the way that you treat your spouse and really anyone else that you come in contact with? What do you think? Yeah, when you think about the idea of the way that Christ accepted you, and when you look at that passage, that's what, that's what rings out to me. You know, accept one another as Christ has accepted you. And you think about how much Jesus has given us. I mean, that he would love us in spite of the fact that we don't have it all together. That he chose to die willingly on the mm -hmm. cross for each one of us, for every wrong thing that we've ever done. Man, that is that's huge. Uh, Jesus had this in spite of type of love, that he loved us in spite of the fact that we don't have it all together. Right. And that's how we should love other people, whether it be our spouse, whether that be the person walking down the street, anybody else, we should care about them and love them. Um, what that also means is you've got to stop trying to change people. And I love that Todd said that this weekend. I um, mean, you got to stop trying to change the person. Stop trying to make them into the image of what you want them to be, but instead accept them for who they are. Mm. Love them for the fact that they don't have it all together. And right. don't expect them just to kind of fit into that mold, that box that you want them to be in. Yeah. And if I'm looking into uh, some of the keywords in the passage that stick out to me, uh, verse 8 says, remember that Christ came as a servant mm -hmm. to the Jews, right? So yeah. there's that word being a servant. And then he also came so the Gentiles might give glory to God. Why? For his mercies to them, mm -hmm. right? So there's this idea of being a servant and kind of modeling mercy. 
And so when I look at that and I, I think, um, how, how much have I been served by God? Mm-hmm. How much of his mercy shown up in my daily life, right? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, what is it that I need to do to look at someone else and serve them? And so I think whether you're talking about marriage relationship, which yep. I think, you know, Andrew talked about, or just anyone else, mm-hmm. which has been kind of a hot button issue for us the last two weeks, Correct. especially, is like, look at them and say, uh, I may not understand your point of view. Correct. I may not understand what you're going through. I may not agree with it, but what can I find to serve you? Or how can I be merciful in my interaction with you? Correct. Would you agree with that? Oh, I totally agree with that. Uh, that you got to start with service and mercy. Yeah. Uh, for any relationship to exist and for any relationship to get better, I got to serve that other person. Right. Whether that be a marriage or whether that just be our daily friendships. Yeah. Some of my best friends I haven't got along with all the time, sure. but we've worked through those conflicts. We've worked through those difficulties and I've accepted them. And I've walked with them through life and just the difficulties that they've gone through. And we've got to be willing to accept one another, just like Todd said this weekend. It's so important. Right. Yeah, and I think just going back to that, too, is like uh, in this passage, in in no way does it say, you know, Christ came as a servant to the Jews. Oh, and he also on Facebook makes sure that he pwned everyone Correct. and gotcha yes. and slammed them. And, and he you trolled know, and, behind people. Yeah, yeah, trolled people whenever they said or so. oh, well, actually, uh, you know, like that doesn't help change Correct. people. And it also doesn't help bring glory to him, right? For this, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing praises to your name. Why? Because of service and mercy. Correct. Right. Okay, so moving on. Uh, go ahead and enter your, your comments here into... Um, The comments below as well, but we're going to be, we're going to flip over to Psalm 103, verses 6 through 12. Psalm 103, verses 6 through 12. It says this, The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. Mm -hmm. He will not, he will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all of our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve for his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins uh, as far from us as the east is from the west. So the question to consider, and Andrew, you got to give us a little bit of background on what's going on here, but do you forgive quickly or do you hold a judge or a grudge? Why or why not? And how should God's forgiveness impact your relationships? Yeah, I think this is an interesting psalm because it's all about how God is forgiving. And that's the nature of who God is. God describes himself as slow to anger, rich in love, abounding in grace. And man, that's just the nature of who he is. And so, man, he is forgiving. And I think we have a hard time forgiving other people. Uh, A lot of times we hold grudges as well. Um, Typically, I don't have a hard time so much with like other people in the office. Like I'm really quick to forgive if somebody's wearing too much cologne or perfume or (laughs) anything like that. That's a really easy one to forgive. Uh, But in my family, um, that's where it's harder to not hold the grudge. Uh, with the people that live in your same household or brothers or sisters or relatives, those seem to be the hardest people, Eric, for me to Mm. just forgive and to not hold a grudge. When a family member hurts your feelings or when a family member says something that's inappropriate or does something in the past to you that's hurt Mm. you, man, those are the hardest people to not hold a grudge with. But that's not the nature of who God is, right? The nature of God is that he has removed all of our sins. He's put them as far as the east is from the west. That's how much he loves us. Yeah. And in that same way, we've got to learn to forgive one another. Um, but that's also not just for the other person. Uh, I love what Todd said this weekend because he said, forgiveness is a gift that you give yourself. Right. When you forgive other people, you are actually giving yourself a gift so that you don't have to allow that person to live rent-free in your mind mm-hmm. over and over again, but so you can actually release that back to God. Right, yeah. And we got a great comment here too. Um, Angelina says, I'm stuck between accepting and not allowing toxic relationships or mm-hmm. friendships either. And so I think when we're talking about holding a grudge or forgiveness or mercy, anything like that, like it, it is tough because you got to look biblically and sometimes the, the conversations of the world or the conversations from honestly toxic people will say, well, you're supposed to forgive me. And so now Ooh, we're yeah. supposed to be in relationship again, right? Oh, you're supposed to forgive me. I said, sorry, you're a Christian. You need to forgive me. Correct. And I think it's important to draw that distinction Correct. and understand wh- when you see in Scripture, what does it talk about when the Lord forgives or when is asking us to forgive and show mercy? And I think exactly what you talk, what you talk about, well, you know what Pastor Todd said, is that, that really holding a grudge is really holding you down and not sure. forgiveness is holding you down. It's it's that old saying that, um, 
you know, holding that grudge or being bitter is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Correct. How many times have you sat there <sighs> stewing about some wrong that someone did to you? Yep. And they probably don't even care or know yeah, about it. Yeah, they've moved past it. They have spent zero amount of time thinking about that mm-hmm. or caring about how you feel right now. And so what, what else can you do? I mean, I, I don't know how many apologies... Right, I'm sure as you're counseling people and as I've yeah. talked to people, and even in my own life, how many apologies people just wait on that will never happen, mm-hmm. that will never, ever happen. Correct. And so you don't need that apology to release that grudge or that forgiveness. And I think it shows in the psalm here because it, uh, it doesn't say the Lord gives righteousness and justice to those who uh, say sorry. Mm-hmm. Whoa, right? He doesn't forgive as soon as you say, oh, man, my bad, right? You know, Correct. like there's a sense that he sent Jesus for us before we even like knew that we needed him. Yep. Uh, okay, kind of went off on that. Do you have anything else to add on that one? Now that I would just say, man, if you are in a toxic relationship and you're in a place where somebody's abusive or hurting you, mm-hmm. we're not advocating you just to accept that other person. Yeah. We're not advocating for you just to stick it out and make it hard. Man, make some changes. Set some good boundaries. Yep. Um, allow yourself to find that healing. Um, and we've got a lot of great groups here through sure. Living Free and other spots where you can get some healing and get some hope, but get out of that situation. Mm-hmm. If you're in a bad spot or a place where it's abusive or hurting you, man, and if we as a church can help, please, please reach right. out. Yeah, a couple of questions about forgiveness, and I think this is a, this is a big topic, which again, um, we can't possibly cover all the questions here. Reach out. If you need some extra help on this one, let us know. So we'd love to have somebody follow up with you. But a couple of questions like how does forgiveness work when you have to set a boundary to keep that toxic person out of your life? Correct. I think we've, we've mentioned that. Um, that That is forgiven. I'm forgiving you, but I'm not allowing you to continue to hurt yep. me. You can't right? hurt me anymore. So that's one. How can forgiveness be done when the other person won't allow it? Um I think that's a little probably nuanced, but for me, it's it's like, well, I, I'm not going to hold a grudge. Correct. And I have to release any sort of negative energy that I'm going to be giving you. What do you think about on yeah, that Yeah, I think there's a lot of situations that we deal with uh, around here like that, because what if that person has died? Right. You know? And like, how do you find forgiveness, even that person, even though that person has passed away? Right. And we encourage a lot of times, sit down, write a letter to that person. Mm. You know, whether they're dead or they're alive and man, man you, you need that distance between you, yeah. sit down and write a letter to them. Yeah. And whether you decide to send it or not, if they're actually alive, it's up to you. Whether that's a take it out and burn it or something mm-hmm. like that, just that way you just have it off, you know, just your own conscious and everything else. And you can just begin to release that to mm-hmm. the Lord. And I think that's one of the other things we talked about, not only saying, hey, if you need forgiveness, forgiveness is a thing that you give. Mm-hmm. That's it. Like that's yep. a, that's a forgiveness thing choice. I'm gonna give. Um, if there's someone that you feel like you need to f- be forgiven of, mm-hmm. that's a little bit of a different story. Where it's like you can apologize and you can go, but th- you're not guaranteed forgiveness. Yep. Right it's from true. another person. So the best you could do is kind of admit, repent, say I'm sorry. This wasn't my intent. This Correct. is what can I do to help make it better. And then whatever they're going to deal with, they're going to deal with, right? It's and, on can, and that's another thing. You can't allow that to continue to hold space in, in your mind as well. Correct. And I can't have that expectation that that other person is going right. to change. And a lot of times we think that, oh man, if I get serious about God, I go to mm-hmm. church. Well, obviously that other person is going to change. Well, that's not always guaranteed. Mm-hmm. You know, your Christ likeness, you walking with the Lord sometimes won't change another person. Right. You have to release that to God. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to work within them. And you got to say, God, Uh, I'm letting this go so that you can work and move. Exactly. So we could keep going on that topic of forgiveness for a while. Like we said, uh, let us know in the comments if if you need some help. I already saw that uh, James helped us out by posting about um, living free. There's other groups available. We'd love to be able to follow up with you, especially if there's like a deep hurt that you're dealing with and you you just need some help with. We can help you out with that. So moving on, though, our last question here is 1 Thessalonians 5.11 tells us to encourage one another how are you doing as an encourager for your spouse and to those around you? And I got to say here, go ahead and answer in the comments, but uh, if you've never been to the Riverside campus or walked around with this guy, I mean, he's just like a ray of sunshine all the time. He's <laughs> passing out encouragement like confetti, man. Like, You're so funny. I'm serious. It's like, uh, uh, not confetti. What's the other What's the other stuff? Glitter? That, glitter. glitter. That's right. It's just like Andy Thank walks you. by you and Lots he's just of encouragement. It's like, I awful. can't even get it off me. It's just so all over. He's like, hey, bro, how's it going? Uh, You're the best. Love what you're doing, man. It's great to you. work with you. And I'm like, oh, thank you, Andrew. That's so great. That's then all so throughout nice. the day, I see you know, I see myself in the mirror and I'm like, what is that? Oh, that was Andrew's encouragement. It's just all over me now. So funny. 
funny, dude. Um, I, I, Do you even remember the question? I, I think so. <laughs> I think it was, how are you doing at encouraging other people and your spouse, Eric? How are you doing as an encourager for your spouse and or those around you. Yeah, I obviously have an easy time encouraging people at church. Um, I would like to say that I do better at, I need to do better at home, obviously. Okay. Um, I have an easy time with people who, you know, I work with and around, uh, but I feel like I am getting better at this. Uh, quarantine has actually been really good for my relationships, both with my yeah. wife and, and with my kids. And my wife and I have these two green chairs out in our front yard, and like they're plastic version of Adirondack chairs because yeah. we can't afford those. Um, so <laughs> we sit out front though, and we have nights where we could just sit and talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has been so healthy for our relationship because uh, we can just sit and talk and find out what's going on with the kids and get on the same page with what's happening in life. And those have been really, really encouraging yeah. times for us. Um, we also went out to dinner for the first time in a real restaurant. Wow. Whoa, the Range Cafe, and it was delicious. Mm. Uh, but we try to maintain date nights is another way that we can encourage one another as well. And so um, I feel like we're getting better. There's always room for improvement. I could always do better as yep. a spouse, as a husband. Um, but I want to be that encourager for my wife. I want to bring out the best in her. Yeah, I think for me, um, when I am, when I'm in a healthy situation myself, encouragement is, is easy. Now, I can generally be very Ooh, this is so important. critical when it mm -hmm. comes to you know feedback and trying to make things better. And I'm a high achievement guy, high yeah. task guy, and so sometimes relationships fall to the wayside. But I think as I've gotten older and realized that like when I'm in a healthy situation, when I've had enough sleep, when I right. make sure that I eat well for the day, when I make sure I'm either well hydrated or well caffeinated, yes. um, and when I can take time to pause and make forgiveness uh, a main part of my life and, and push away grudges, mm -hmm. it's easy to be encouraging. I think the other piece that I have to remind myself a lot, um, because like words of affirmation is one of my top love languages. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it, it comes naturally from me. Mm -hmm. So why don't I do that more often? And I find, I don't know if it's true for you. If I choose to encourage someone, mm -hmm. it makes those grudges fall away. It makes it Correct. easier for me to let go of things because if I can find something, um, you know, like we talked about earlier, in past scriptures, if I could find something to mm -hmm. validate and encourage someone else and, and really point out and go, hey, this is what you're doing really, really well. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that anything else that you're doing on the other side is okay, yep. but I'm going to intentionally encourage. I find it actually just makes my attitude better. Yeah, in and if you want to get the bitterness out of your house... And yeah. if you want to take that away, if there's like a bitter spirit in your house, mm -hmm. you can't be in the same room, easiest way out of that is just to start encouraging one another. Yep. Instead of just being negative, seeing everything that's right. wrong, start picking one thing that's right with your spouse every single day yep. and encourage them with it. Then serve them. Be merciful like we talked about today. And those things kind of come together with, man, how to make it through married life. And I think something that you should find encouraging, Andrew, for you personally is the, especially as you go and read this later, is literally the amount of people that agreed that you are, they've typed in, he is glittery. You, I'm not glittery. Is glittery. I so am not glittery find, one bit. I mean, you're getting, you're getting head nods from people behind the cameras too. That's so so there's so much encouragement coming here. Thank but, you. But I have to say, and I mean, it's not just because I'm sitting next to this guy, but like it, it's much better coming and working in an environment where people are being encouraging. Yeah. So imagine what that's like at home, Correct. right? And I think that, that I found that that's worked with my kids too, Correct. with as many times as I want to uh, try to correct the things that are wrong because you have to. Mm -hmm. But if there's times that you can step in and encourage positive things that they're doing, that's going to keep them um, moving in that direction because they want that feedback. So true. So as we close, this weekend during the service, we talked about five different ways to improve your marriages. If you need to write these down, showing acceptance to your spouse, giving attention to your spouse, offering forgiveness to your spouse, encouraging your spouse, and showing affection to your spouse. If you're married, why don't you tell us what's one area you can work on today to improve your marriage? What's mm -hmm. one action step you could take to improve that area this week? Tell the group that you're working with, you know, pause it, write it down in journal, or let us know in the comments. If you're single, Evaluate your relationships. What can you do this week to be a better family member, a better friend, a better acquaintance to the people around you? What action step can you take this week to improve these relationships? And this is important. Put them in the comments for us because a lot of times mm -hmm. we need the additional idea, right? It's like, I, I may be sitting here thinking, well, I just don't know what I can do. And I see Andrew says, oh, you know what? My wife and I, we spend some time, we talk and we do. 
Oh, that's a great idea. I didn't even think of that. Plastic right? Adirondack chairs. Plastic Adirondack It changes chairs. everything. It changes everything. So write that down. And then in addition, if you have a prayer request, you can enter them in the comments. If you want to get involved in a group or looking for a next step, let us know in the comments. Andrew, is there anything that you uh, want to say before we close? Uh, nothing. We are praying for you guys. We know that, man, when you pursue a marriage with Christ in the center of it, uh, the evil one doesn't want that. So fight the good fight. Keep going with this. Uh, as the world wants to pull you apart, just grow closer and closer together. Man, I appreciate you guys leaning in, though. That's great. You know, we know that this church is going to be stronger if our relationships are stronger. Correct. Not just our marriage relationships, but that's a key part because that's mm -hmm. going to, you know, really keep us closer. It's going to be better for the next generation. But all your relationships in general, look at one of those five ways, showing acceptance, giving attention, offering forgiveness, encouraging, and showing some level of affection. Mm -hmm. That doesn't just count for your spouse. It counts to everybody. So do something today that's going to make somebody else's life better. Don't forget to tune in tomorrow. We've got some uh, some news that Pastor Todd wants to share during his uh, Q&A on Tuesday at noon and then the devotional on Wednesday and then we've got some more things throughout the week. Let us know if there's anything that we could do for you. On behalf of Andrew, I'm Eric. Thanks for hanging out with us.